there are many dimensions to the meaning of the cross and Jesus crucified and risen. Um, we could, I guess we'll spend all of eternity talking about the wonder of it all. And um, we have looked this morning at one dimension of Jesus' journey to the cross, which is the way of the kingdom. This is the way of the kingdom, to embrace and forgive the enemy. It's astonishing. It's the way of the kingdom that he exemplified. And I want to just comment a bit yet as we leave this topic on the forgiveness of sins, which is just very central also to the, to the meaning of the cross. Jesus on that cross cries out in forgiveness to those who put him on that cross. Um, our Muslim friends yearn for forgiveness. Um, I remember one time in a mosque in Philadelphia during Ramadan, there was, uh, the mosque was full of people and they were having uh, two hours of extra prayers. In fact, they told us that every night during Ramadan, they were meeting there for these extra prayers. In fact, they had a specially trained imam in from England who then during the day would give Islamic instructions and so forth, and he was leading these prayers. So they said, we're saying these extra prayers during Ramadan because there's the scales, and these prayers are uh, uh, balanced scales, and the wrong we do goes on one side of the scales, and these extra prayers and the good that we do goes on the good side of the scales. We talked about this the other day. Um, and so we're saying these extra prayers hoping that they will outweigh the wrong that we have done so that we might be forgiven at the judgment day. And I asked them, have you said enough of prayers? And they said, we have no idea. We don't know. I said, I can understand that. Suppose you have been involved, God forbid, but suppose one among us has been involved in adultery. Would a million prayers compensate for the wrong that you have done to your wife and the other woman and against your own body? What do these ritual prayers have to do with the wrong that you've done? That I can understand why you don't know if you've ever said enough of prayers to outweigh the bad that you've done. But I said there's very, very good news. Jesus the Messiah has given his life on the cross for our forgiveness. And so we know we're forgiven. So the scales is kaput. I said within Islam, you have this understanding that a ram was slain as a tremendous sacrifice. That's what the Quran says, a tremendous sacrifice so that Ishmael may be redeemed from death. Right? Yes, 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 we believe that. And every year in the pilgrimage, you offer hundreds of thousands of rams remembering that this ram was a substitutionary sacrifice for Ishmael. What's all that about? Ah, we bear witness. The gospel reveals that those rams, not only within Islam, but the sacrifices of animals and religions all over the world are signs deep in the soul of humankind that we need a substitutionary sacrifice. And Jesus, the Messiah, when he begins his ministry, God reveals through John the Baptist, the prophet John the Baptist, that he is the Lamb of God. In fact, that's how John introduced him to the people. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Which means Jesus is the fulfillment of all those sacrifices. He is the Lamb slain who has taken our place. And that's why all of those who believe in Jesus with humility, not with arrogance at all, but with humility and great joy we bear witness, we know we are forgiven. The scales is kaput. It is no more, for Jesus has taken our place. And they said, no, no, that's impossible. If you go to a court of law, and you're being tried for a crime you have done, and the judge pronounces judgment, no one can take your place. You must take the punishment for your own sin. There can be no substitute. I said, you're exactly right. Exactly right. But there's one exception. Just one exception. 
if the judge is sitting on his judgment seat and he has pronounced judgment, but then he comes into the courtroom and he says, I will take your place, then you're free. And in Jesus, God, the judge of the whole universe and all of history, has entered the courtroom. And he says, I've taken your place. That in what happened on the cross, God in Christ has taken our place. And so we give thanks. We know we're forgiven. Whew. That night, there was absolute silence in that mob. And then the imam said, too deep. Too deep for tonight. I said, I plead with you. Don't dismiss this good news that I've shared with you tonight by just saying it's too deep. It's a miracle of how much God loves us. And that proclamation of sins forgiven is such good news. Muslim friends yearn to be forgiven. That's why they go to the mosque five times a day. The final judgment, I don't know. Don't know. The wonderful witness that in Jesus, the Lamb of God, <laughs> we're forgiven. What happened on that cross, we're forgiven. I never want to graduate from the wonder of it all. I, David Shank, am a forgiven sinner. Jesus died for my sins. Let's pause for questions or comments you might have. I think before the break you had a question or a comment. Uh, if in uh, Islam theology, the truth doesn't suffer, and uh, Muhammad uh, escapes suffering. Like, uh, how they, uh, do they counsel those who uh, suffer uh, innocent? They didn't, uh, like they were born blind, for example. What would be the word of comforting to them in Islam theology? No, that's a very, very, very good question. Um, because God is sovereign and transcendent and does not participate with us in our suffering. I feel that there is a great <laughs> a great uh, need for a theology that embraces the reality that God does participate with us in our suffering. I mentioned the other day those Darfur widows where I preached in Khartoum that in Jesus God has understood and participated in all that you're experiencing. You know, that's such good news. And after church, they went out into the courtyard and they sang and danced for half an hour. Jesus understands, he participates, and he's resurrected from the dead, empowering us also to transcend and triumph over what we've, what we've experienced. That, that the word of comfort to those who suffer is the word, as I hear Muslims, that you simply submit to the sovereignty of God. God determined this. He is sovereign. So ask no question. Accept the suffering. You know, the gospel says, yes, accept the suffering, but you're not alone. In Jesus, God is right there with you, participating with you in the suffering. He has also tasted suffering. <laughs> right there with you. You're not alone. So those widows go out in the courtyard and they sang for half an hour, Yesu, 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 Yesu. He understands, is with us. Extremely good question. Gospel is such good news. Other questions? Let's um, just summarize what we've been sharing on these theologies of the Hijra and the cross by looking at your outline, point four. We're at the end now of this, of this section. 11.4, where we have some contrasting comments in regards to the directions the gospel takes us and the directions in which Islam takes us. Um, and we'll begin at 4.1. And let's just take turns going around the, the room and reading these, these contrasting statements. So um, we'll start with Ken and just go up the line like that. 4.1. Read both statements, please. Islam says the kingdom of God cannot be established without the use of political and military power. The gospel says the kingdom of God happens through the cross, not political and military power. 
Okay. 4.3. Islam. Muhammad's military success is evidence that he is a prophet of God. Gospel. The crucifixion and uh, resurrection of Jesus is the proof that Jesus the Messiah. Okay. Olga? Islam says, Muslim ethics are based on the way Muhammad uh, established his authority in Medina. Gospel says, Christian ethics are based on the way of the cross that Jesus demonstrated. Okay. Then point five, the significance of the cross for the forgiveness of sins. Islam, each person must receive the just punishment for her son as sins. Gospel, Jesus the Messiah took our place taken upon him, himself, the punishment for our sins. <clears throat> Islam, uh, God decided who to forgive. All from text of praying might preside God to show special mercy. Gospel, uh, the Messiah is the significance for our sins, and so all who will are uh, invited to receive the girl of forgiveness. Islam, uh, no one, no one can be sure that he is forgiven. Gospel, all who believe are forgiven. All is by grace, unmerited favor. Okay. And then Islam, believers strive to acquire merit worthy of forgiveness. Gospel believers joyously seek to serve God faithfully in thankfulness for the gift of grace and forgiveness. And it is that gift of forgiveness that leads us to sing so joyously when we gather together in our worship services. Our Muslim friends say to me, have said sometimes, when you Christians worship, it sounds as if you're having a party. And I say, that's exactly right. We are having a party. <laughs> we can't help but sing with joy because in Jesus Christ, we know we're forgiven by the grace of God. Such good news. Any final comments as we leave that section? Yes. I, I remember you told that Islam uh, leader in that mosque told uh, too deep. Maybe he thinks that uh, this message of forgiveness is, is okay or Western for Christians, but for our society in this particular level of its development and people are too sinful, if you tell them they can be forgiven, they will go all the way to sin because they, they could be forgiven easily. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. That Muslims say if you do away with the scales, um, then uh, what is the control mechanism that leads people to live, right, to live righteously? That's exactly right. Yeah. Of course, Paul's struggling with the same thing in his letters to the Philippians, or even to the Galatians, you know. Shall we, uh, shall we sin so that God will be glorified, so his grace might be ever more abundant? Oh, no, he says, we don't keep on sinning. When we've met Christ and received the gift of forgiveness, the Holy Spirit brings about his transformational work in our lives. We live righteously to glorify God. Oh, we learn, we yearn to glorify God. Not that we might gain merit, but to glorify God, that's our greatest yearning, is, uh, is, uh, is the theology that Paul develops, which is certainly what Jesus was all about. The motivation to not to sin because of the fear and yes. punishment, yes. Yes. the motivation not to sin because yes. of love yes. and yes. forgiveness. Yes. 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 And certainly as Christians, we need to take very, very, very seriously the call to discipleship. Remember Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, uh, Call of Discipleship, written many years ago, uh, where he asked the question, how can it be that Christians throughout Europe is, is, you know, so quickly embrace the Nazi thing, you know, and the killing of Jews? And so, how could this be that the churches got seduced by this whole theology? And he says it was the theology of cheap grace. You just come and you take the bread and drink the, drink the wine in the church, you're forgiven, and go out now and kill Jews. Um, that sort of theology, cheap grace, which has nothing to do with ethical commitment. And Bonhoeffer says, look, Jesus calls us to discipleship. Receive the gift of grace and follow him. And because of who Jesus is, even following him is grace, you see. But we're called to follow him. Jesus makes that very, very clear. Um, <laughs> so don't presume upon the grace of God. Don't presume. Receive his grace, receive his forgiveness, but don't be, be presumptuous. Take the call to discipleship very seriously.
the end of history, there'll be this great divide between the sheep and the goats. The sheep are those who visited the poor, went to the prisons and so forth, fed the hungry. And the goats are those who pay no attention to the poor. And there'll be that great divide. Yeah. So live righteously, live compassionately. If you receive God's grace, then exemplify it in, uh, in your actions. So the Muslim concern, we need to hear that. When Muslims look at Western culture, assume that it's Christian, and look at pornography and yeah. Yeah. alcoholism yeah. and everything else, and yeah. say, well, that, there's your yeah. freedom. Yeah. Do they often bring that? Oh, yes, yeah. certainly, certainly. Certainly they do. Yeah. How do you answer that? Yeah. Well, um, I think, <laughs> I'd say that this is a revelation of our sinfulness. Every culture participates in sinfulness. In fact, if you look honestly at Muslim societies, you also find a lot of issues which are not right. Bribery and whatnot and whatnot. You know, cultures are endemically sinful. Um, I hear my Muslim friends say that, it, that the Ummah is the perfect community, which will never go astray. And I just say, would you show me one example of this kind of a community so I could go visit it? I haven't observed any perfect Ummahs yet. <laughs> You know, sinfulness is sinfulness, whether you live in the West or whether you live in the Islamic society, the Islamic world. It's, it's always present. We need redemption. We need to be redeemed from our sinfulness. No society is, uh, is exempt from, from the poison of sinfulness. That's not to justify our sinfulness in the Western world. The church is the church, and society is, is society. Um, the church is not... The American way of life is a different community. I you often say, come and see our churches. You'll see transformed lives in our churches, people living righteously, drug addicts being redeemed, marriages being healed. Come and see. Young people living righteously and chaste lives. It's wonderful. Come and visit our churches. <laughs> and we, we don't have it all together. If you look, you'll find sinfulness within our churches too. But we repent and we keep returning to Christ and being renewed through his spirit. 